experience about the, the theme today. We have one hour approximately, so this is 6.45 and I hope 7.45 will be done. Most of us is, uh, have experience in watching or going through Asian film, Nina, uh, Russell, uh, Boris, uh, and uh, Andre, uh, and Mr. Matson here. Uh, also will give us uh, you know, our best thoughts of the issue. You will get the best. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. But okay. Maybe we start with um, Andre first, you know. Boris? Okay, we start with Boris. But maybe I should start also by sharing my experience before Boris. Um, Indonesia is a, a country that uh, independence in 1945. Uh, around seven years after our independence, we start our national film, uh, sort of national film spirit, and express, uh, use film to express uh, our identity as a nation. The first film made in Indonesia is actually mostly film about the revolution or the role of uh, people, Indonesian in the revolution against the Dutch colonial at the time. And that is like a setup of how the industry in Indonesia, in Indonesian cinema, is all about spirit of independence, spirit of fighting against colonialism, against uh, injustice. And uh, that's how we started to develop sort of in our constitution about the role of cinema. Indonesia is very proud if we make film that uphold the spirit of you know how great our country, how diverse our country, how religious we are. Because we are the biggest Muslim, not Muslim country, but the, we have the biggest population of Muslim in the world, around 85% out of 250 million population. And uh, that's it, you know. We, we are very uh, much proud of that. But at the same time, after a few years, we started to open our our um, sort of our our uh, self to you know diversity of culture including cinema so since 1960s we imported films from all over the world and, and um, this is in my opinion most interestingly is producing two types of uh, effect number one is Indonesian filmmakers become very much affected by the, these rules and ideology we started to produce mainly formalist film. And the second effect is Indonesian filmmakers become very creative to do film against, you know. We started to have some of the best cinemas in the 70s and the 80s. That is during the toughest time of censorship. We, we got our film, you know, submitted to the Venice Film Festival. Uh, all the way to the 90s when some films by Gary Negro, for example, is shown in Cannes Film Festival. So censorship gives good, bad effect, but also good effect towards the film industry. Okay, and um, you know, this is how we started, and this is maybe something that we can we can start to you know, as a as a talk. Can I come in on that? Yeah. Is this the yeah. yeah. Here. Yeah. I mean, that point that you say that like you know, I don't think it's on there. Maybe that one. Okay. Yeah, no, that's better. Um, one of the things is, as you said, the, the point of uh, Indonesian cinema with the strict rules of censorship uh, caused the film directors to be inventive. I mean, it's really kind of indicative of like the classic era of Hollywood cinema was when the Hayes Code was in operation, uh, the Iranian cinema, and you know, uh, you could say the Czech cinema, you know, the, the Czech New Wave and what have you. That there's, I mean, there's different kinds of censorship. And we need to be really clear about what that is. But one of the things, you know, as Riri said, is that censorship gives creative people something to brush up against, and it forces them to make, you know, to come up with solutions that go around the bureaucracy and to communicate with the audience in a way that bypasses the censors. And you know, some film industries can do it. You know, like. I'm not saying that every Hollywood film made under the Hayes Code is a masterpiece, because I wouldn't, that's just not true. They are uh, not at all the cognizance of all this that he's talking about. That there is a change in place. 
But the interesting thing about the Indian Censor, or we call it the Censor Board, they call themselves the Board of Film Certification, but we all know it's the Film Censor, is that you know, there are so many other ways to get things out there now, so why do you do it for film? Because film is probably the most powerful art expression that there is. Nobody's looking at paintings anymore. You know, music industry has been destroyed. I mean, what is there left? There's movies and documentaries. That's the internet. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> and we could do without it, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe, but maybe we should go to uh, the Oh, Boris Press. Yeah, sorry, sorry. That's a great shirt, man. <laughs> you too. All right, thank you. Um, well, uh, I would like to start uh, that I really don't believe that any values should be protected because, come on, I mean, uh, the human civilization developed uh, all essential values and the uh, internet uh, for the last uh, 10 years or cinema for the last uh, 100 years could destroy these values. I don't believe it really. And I mean, it's really, I really think that it's a very dangerous talk. Uh, because it's always the last argument that there are right children and so we, we can show violence, sex, homosexuals, smoking, kissing, friendship, anything because uh, children are always children are always in danger. Everybody, you know, when rock and roll first came out, let's face it, all these people were breaking records and burning down things and it didn't stop it from happening. I know that every generation thinks that they want to protect their children from the next generation. And these damn teenagers don't know what the hell's going on. You know, that's not what I'm saying, man. I mean, I think that there's a lot of good from uh, advancing people's access to whatever they want to see. I don't know the answer, buddy. I'm just saying that maybe there should be, and even if I talk about regulating that, I'm basically advocating the, the very thing that I'm against. So I'm as confused as anybody. But that's why we're here. Damn it. Oh, yeah, but I just want to say that I think that cinema, making cinema is always dealing with obstacles and with restrictions. And actually, uh, like, you know, like our great Soviet uh, uh, masters of cinema, like, for instance, Atar Eseliani, Georgian filmmaker, he was just in Locarno this year, he got the honorary prize, and he told that in Soviet Union, in so in Soviet Union for him was better to work because uh, he, he knew the rules of game, he knew how to deal with that, and now there is uh, another kind of censorship, censorship of money, of producers, and everything. And I mean, I mean cinema, cinema is always political, I mean, and cinema is very expensive. <laughs> And uh, that's yeah. what I'm worried about, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you want to say something? Yeah. I, I'm just going to say, like, in Australia, we don't call it censorship, we call it classification. Yeah. So that people know what they're going into. Or what we only have 11 people looking, and, uh, and they look at, and they tend to go in groups, look at stuff in groups of five, and if the film is, um, maybe they approve something, or if they think that uh, a film it could be problematic, then they bring the other six in to make sure that, and there's a, the 11th person has like the final vote, the chief kind of censor. But we have a kind of procedure in Australia where, uh, uh, I'll use the example of the Pasolini film, um, Salo. Salo has been banned in Australia about seven or eight times because what happens is the film gets banned and then there's some discussion about it and then it gets approved, and then after a year or two, we have a procedure in Australia where if you're offended by something, you can write to your local parliamentarian, and they will take it to the censorship board. As long as, but you have to target the right parliamentarian, because a lot of people will say, you're crazy, you just, you know, you're, you just do this for a political reason, as Michael said. And what's happened with Solo is, gone through this procedure seven or eight times.